So as the story goes, William Beebe, and the, who was an explorer, and his friend, who happened to be President Theodore Roosevelt, often they would get together, and the two men would go outdoors at night, and they would try to see who would be the first among them to locate the Andromeda Galaxy. Well, we know the Andromeda Galaxy is one of the most distant objects that we can actually see with the naked eye. And as they gazed, they would try to find this tiny smudge on the horizon, the distant starlight. And then one of them would recite, this is the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. And it is large as the Milky Way. It is one of a hundred mil million galaxies. It is 750,000 light years away. It consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our own sun. After that, recitation would sink into their own hearts and minds, and Roosevelt would smile, and he says, now I think we are small enough, we can now sleep in peace. Well, we now know that the Andromeda Galaxy is actually 2.6 million light years away and consists of one trillion stars, about twice the number of our galaxy. And while the numbers of these estimates keep increasing, Astronomers think that there are at least 100 to 200 billion galaxies, not 100 million. So Mr. Beebe and President Roosevelt would feel even smaller. God is so big and we are so small. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. And his thoughts are beyond our thoughts. With this very broad frame of mind, as Paul is writing this book to the Romans, he comes to chapter 11 and he begins to look at the eternal plan of salvation in a very broad way. He begins to look at the no, how salvation can, has unfolded can, down through the centuries. And he captures the essence of how the Jews and the Gentiles fit together in God's eternal plan. But this morning, I'd like us to look at May, can you Romans say 11 in even peaceful and consider three lessons after huh? looking can at you that. not jump in that it doesn't feel I'm good i'm hearing somebody still online pastor hang so okay thank you so paul begins he romans chapter 11 in this book that he's writing and he's asking a question about the jews romans 11 1 and then 5 and 6. i asked then did God reject his people, he's speaking of the Jews, by no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin, verse 5. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Paul begins to see here God has always had a remnant. He has always had those who choose to trust in the grace of God. The questions at hand, well, was God still concerned for Israel? After all, weren't they God's chosen people to bring the Messiah into the world? So Paul begins to unpack. He says, no, no, God did not reject the Jews. He himself is a proof of that. He is evidence that, that yes, Jews can be born again. And if God could save Paul, then God could certainly save other Jews. God's grace toward Paul illustrates the kind of compassion that God shows to Israel as a whole. If you look at the text, you see he refers to Elijah. Elijah, at one time, he, he thought he was, he was the only one that was faithful to the Lord. And God told him, no, not true. God wasn't limited to somehow to one fearful, depressed prophet who thought he was all alone. God tells Elijah, I still have a remnant of 7,000 people, a faithful remnant in Israel. I still have people, God told him, that have responded to the grace of God. 
God always has a remnant. We are a remnant, if you will, faithful believers, because we have chosen to trust in God's grace rather than our own worthiness. God is concerned about us. He is there for us. We are never alone. Dallas Willard tells the story of a young boy whose mom died. And he was especially sad and, and lonely at night, and he would come into his father's room and ask his father if he could sleep with him. And he couldn't rest, not only that he was just with his father, but he wanted his father's face turned toward him. Father, is your face turned toward me now? His father would say, yes, you are not alone. I am with you. My face is turned toward you. And then the boy was assured and he would be able to fall asleep. It's the same way as we trust in Christ, God's face turns toward us. We are not alone. As we're reading that scripture passage this morning, we're just thinking, our transgressions have been taken away from us. What a release that is. This past week as I was reading God's word, God just released me in a fresh way as it just, the word of God comes alive. He makes himself known to us. He releases us from the hang-ups, the bondages, the fears that we experience. I felt like, well, have you ever had a fever? I'm sure you've had a fever. Well, I felt like I had a spiritual fever, but I was reading the Word of God, and it was like that fever broke. And I felt that release from God. I'm not alone. You're not alone. God cares. God's grace is extended to you and me. We have responded to God's grace. Well, back to the Jews, because Paul continues. He said some responded to God's initiative of grace, but most did not. He writes in Romans 11, 7 and 8, What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. Well, just like today, people who, have, who follow God, it wasn't based on somehow God selecting them, you're in, you're out. It was based on their responsiveness to the initiative of grace that God extended to them. Election is not selection. God extended his grace. People chose to be in or out, to follow God or not, to respond in faith or not. It was based on their responsiveness. They either responded to God's grace or they failed to respond to God's grace. And those who responded to God's grace, they, their hearts grew softer. And those who did not respond to God's grace, who rejected God's grace, their hearts grew harder. God didn't want his own people to have a spirit of stupor, but he allowed them to reap the consequences of their own choices. And the more they followed after God's way, the more God showed himself to them in his ways. And the more that they resisted God, they became confused, the scripture says. They became spiritually blind and deaf. Some, yes, responded to God's initiative of grace, but most did not. And frankly, it's the same today. The grace of God is like God saying to us, here's your life. You might never have been born but you were, you were born. You were placed on planet Earth because life would not have been complete without you. And God says, here is the world before you. Beautiful things are there. Terrible things will happen too. But he says to us, don't be afraid. I am with you, he says. Nothing, nothing can ever separate us because it's for you that I created the universe. And God says to us, I love you. But like any other gift that we receive, the gift of grace is only ours if we respond to it, if we reach out and take it. Otherwise, we reap the consequences of our choices. 
Furthermore, Israel's rejection meant that all other people could hear the good news and be reconciled to God. This is the question he's working his way through. Romans 11, 11 and 12. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation became to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion be? Well, the rejection of the Jews became the opportunity to reach the Gentiles, many of us, us. Well, God's purpose was really to reach the whole world through the Gentiles. God called, called Israel to accomplish this. He wanted to save the Gentiles through the Jews, but their rejection did not change God's plan. He just modified the way that he would accomplish his plan. Instead of saving the Gentiles through the Jews, God saved the Gentiles in spite of the Jews. And when the chosen people designated as the vehicles of God's blessing to the world, when they actually blocked the message of God, Block the message from getting through. God made sure that his good news message arrived anyways. The riches of God's grace, the reconciliation that we have with God has been made available to the whole world. And, and Paul begins to write about the natural branches of the vine, unbelieving Israel being broken off, and then Gentiles, the wild olive shoot being grafted in. But this judgment, it's not permanent. People of Israel can still enjoy salvation by responding in faith to the Messiah. Paul even anticipated that the Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus would, would provoke would Israel in responding to God's grace, accepting the good news of Jesus. They would become envious, he says, realizing their loss, deciding to follow Jesus. Their rejection meant that all other people could hear the good news and be reconciled to him. When you think about this, this is the way God works. Open doors, closed doors. When one door closes, God opens another one. How often we look with a sense of regret upon the closed door that, that we don't see the door that God is opening for us. And for some of you, you need to hear this God speaking to you. When one door closes, God opens another door. And how oftentimes we look with a sense of regret upon that closed door and we don't see the door that God is opening for us. In light of Israel's rejection, the Gentiles, well, they shouldn't become complacent or arrogant about our position in God's eternal plan. Romans 11, 12, 21 to 22. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Well, God is like a parent. He's like a parent. He's stern toward those who disobeyed, and he's kind to those who continue to trust in his kindness. But if, they, if you stop trusting, you'll be cut off. And of course... Paul is discussing here the Gentiles collectively, not the experience of individual believers. And he warns the Gentiles that we're obligated to Israel. We shouldn't therefore boast of the spiritual position that we have. Us Gentiles have entered into the plan of God because of God's grace through faith, not because of some worthiness that we brought to the table. And if God could temporarily set aside Israel as a whole because of unbelief, then certainly he could set aside the Gentiles because of complacency, because of arrogance. So he says, don't forget the root. Don't forget the tree in which you were grafted. Jews can be restored at any time as they believe. Gentile Christians be can cut off at any time if they fall into unbelief. That's the panoramic view of Romans 11. And as I look at this chapter, I see three lessons, at least three lessons that we can see of this big picture of God's eternal plan. The first one is this. We are nothing and God is everything. God is God. He has an eternal plan. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. 
We can never look it upon ourselves as greater in our own eyes. Rather, God is the one who is merciful. He is the one who has extended his grace to us. He is the one who has made faith possible. We worship him. We express our gratefulness to him. Big picture. Sometimes I think about the course of all human history like an ocean liner crossing the Atlantic Ocean from New York to London. Picture it with me. God sees everything from point A to point B. We don't. But the ocean liner continues on its direct course from beginning to end, commanded by God, following his eternal plan. All we see is life and time in history within the parameters and the boundaries of the ocean liner. Nations rise and fall. Countries emerge and disappear. Kingdoms rise and fall. Leaders emerge and disappear. Economies rise and fall. Time passes. History is written, and the ocean liner keeps on its journey. The furniture on the ocean liner gets rearranged. The rooms get remodeled. The decks are torn apart and rebuilt. Good leaders serve well, but they're forgotten, and their ways of justice and mercy and humility are soon forgotten and left in the dust. Dictators strut onto the scene of history like proud peacocks. They bring destruction in their wake, but soon they're gone like a wisp of air. The animal kingdom thrives and shrinks. Forests grow and then are no longer there. Babies are born, grow, get married, have children. Generations live and die. And the ocean liner continues on its direct course journey from beginning to end, commanded by God, following his eternal plan. Time marches on, years, decades, centuries, millennia. Human history continues to unfold. Crises take place, decisions are made, humanitarian goals are achieved. People are pushed to the lower decks of the ocean liner while others come out onto the upper decks in all their regalia and the bands keep playing. Wars rage and peace follows, good things happen, discoveries are made, inventions are developed, humanity makes progress, violence comes about, disasters take place, Darkness sets in, pain and suffering are everywhere, and the ocean liner continues on its direct course journey from beginning to end, commanded by God, following his eternal plan. The sun sets and seasons come and go, the, ri the tide rises and falls, flowers bloom and fade, mountains crumble, time marches on, God changes not. We cry out to God, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. And the ocean liner continues on its direct course journey from beginning to end, commanded by God following his eternal plan. And we learn with wisdom we are nothing, and God is everything. Second, God's gracious attitude toward his fellow Jews should be true for all of us. Unfortunately, some of the generations that follow the New Testament, Gentiles treated Jews as Messiah murderers. But just to be clear, it wasn't Jews that put Jesus on the cross. It was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. Jesus came to die. That was God's plan. And we all put Jesus on the cross. We are guilty of that crime. Yet sadly, anti-Semiticism has continued down through the centuries, just like con racism continues against any group that is other or different or unlike the majority in power. And even in the last century, anti-Semiticism led to the Holocaust and to the genocide of millions of Jews. And we still see 
this kind of racism today. Just this past Thursday evening, Manhattan, three teens harassed a Hasidic man, snatched his hat, demanded that he yell out, free Palestine, to get his hat back. 20-year-old victim, he complied, but they didn't return his hat. The police are following through. But my point is this, that the racist attitude against the Jews is never, ever found in Paul. It's not found in the New Testament. It's not found in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world. Paul even stated in Romans chapter 9, For I wish that I could, I myself were cursed and cut off from, for Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And then in Romans 10, My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. And just because Paul was this missionary to the Gentiles, his identity as a Jew and his love for the Jews were not diminished. God, Paul's gracious attitude toward fellow Jews, that should be true for all of us. The third lesson that I see in Romans chapter 11 is that God hasn't finished with Israel yet. God has still something more for Israel. And I know when a lot of people think of Israel today, they think of political Israel. They think of geographical Israel, the nation of Israel. And then Christians sometimes to sort out the politics of what's going on in the Middle East, they try to line it up with Bible prophecies, and sometimes they just find a verse for every headline in the news to explain what is going on in the Middle East. But actually, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Ever since Jesus rose from the dead, We've been in the last days. So dissecting all of the headlines to find some specific prophecy that's been fulfilled might not make all that much sense. I'm told if you want to capture an audience, talk about end times. If you want to pack out a church, have a prophecy conference. Christians, non-Christians alike, they seem to be drawn to that. Many, many questions. Tribulation, Antichrist, Armageddon. The land in Israel, Dome of the Rock, rebuilding the temple, Palestinians. There's a time and a place to discuss all of that, of course. Yet how many people follow through with those conversations and that focus and they're the same as they were before? That's the part that bothers me. Information and even speculation without transformation. So basically, I'm not convinced that the political nation of Israel as we see it today is what the Bible is talking about. Some focus on the homeland, anticipate a national restoration of Israel under Christ. Many take that position, and those who do may be right. But for me, I see a different focus. I see a focus that God is concerned not so much for political Israel as he is for the people of Israel. God has, this, uh, in his redemptive plan, he has a special place for ethnic Israel to come to faith. And somehow, as I read the scriptures, I see the second coming of Christ. Many Jews will believe in the Messiah. How will that take place? Verse 26 here in this chapter says, all Israel will be saved. And for me, that means that there's a strong number of Jewish people that will come to trust Jesus as their Messiah. Sometimes people get hung up on the word all. Well, we use it the same way today. Everybody came to church today. Well, what do we mean by everybody? Everybody in the whole world? No. Everybody in all of Flushy? No. Everybody that's connected with the QCAC? A strong number, a large number, most everyone, everyone except those who are sick or out of town. All Israel will be saved, Paul says. Connected somehow to the second coming of Christ, a strong number living at that time will come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And as I understand the scriptures, probably during the millennium, Israel will be restored in some way, bringing blessing to the entire world. And I read the rest of scripture, that's what makes sense to me at this particular point in time. <laughs> But in the meantime, of utmost importance is understanding these verses in Romans 11. It should motivate us for evangelism among Jewish people. That's the most important part. That's what Paul's concern is. We have some aspect of guaranteed success with that. God's chosen people, Israel, was to bring Jesus into the world. 
They were intended as this vehicle for proclaiming the good news of Christ. And God hasn't finished with Israel yet. God still has something more for Israel. So when you read prophetic scripture, the goal is not to somehow create a sense of curiosity just about the pure about the future, rather is there to motivate us for a sense of con concern and compassion for people who need Jesus. Because Paul says to the Gentiles, to many of us, don't get too cocky about Israel's prominent place in my eternal plan of salvation. Don't get too comfortable about it either because God can just as easily graft them back in and splice you right out. Final note, let's give praise to God for his greatness, his grace, his glory. In writing this chapter, Paul begins to see this panoramic view of God's great plan of salvation for Jews and for Gentiles alike, and he breaks out in a song of praise. Theology becomes doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Well, we can understand the mind of God by reading the scriptures, but nobody fully understands what God is thinking. Nobody can come alongside God and give him counsel of what he doesn't already know. Nobody can offer him some advice on how he can improve what he's doing or somehow how he's doing it, we can somehow offer some improvement to him. He knows what he's doing, past, present, and future. He, he knows what's best for the past and for now and forever, and he's following through on his eternal plan. And who has ever given to God that we should repay him, verse 35. God reaches out to us through his grace. We're debtors to him. We, we owe him everything. God owes us nothing. Every dollar in our pocket, that's a gift from God. Every lung full of air that we breathe is a blessing from God. Every heartbeat is God's grace being displayed to us. Your home, your car, your family, your job, your health, your intellect, your talents, your possessions, all of these are God's gift to you. What does God want in return? He just wants your love. He wants your obedience. He gives us everything. All he asks of us is that we begin to honor him by receiving his son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. And when we do that, then his real giving begins. For from him and through him and for him are all things, all single syllables, monosyllables for from him and through him and for him are all things a child just learning to read because easily spell those words out but when we begin to think about them how can we exhaust the depth of their meaning it's all from him God's plan it came from God it wasn't humanity's idea we didn't say, well, I've offended God and I need to be able to find some way to get back to him. So I'm going to have to work out a plan to get back to God. In our spiritual indifference, in our spiritual death, we didn't, we didn't actually care about a plan. If we did care, we wouldn't be smart enough anyways. We wouldn't be wise enough to make a plan because it's all from him. And it's all through him. If we had a plan, we couldn't ha make it happen. We couldn't free ourselves from our own prison of self and selfishness and sin. It could only happen through him, only through him, through Jesus, on his behalf, through him, salvation comes. And it's all for him, not for me, not for you, for him. It's for the praise of his glorious grace. It's for his pleasure that we were created. It's for in giving him honor and glory that we find fulfillment. To him be glory forever verse 36 the Paul says the fact that he can't figure it out he, it makes him glorify God all the more and we understand the greatness of God we worship him all the more passionately amen Paul says there's nothing more to add 
Augustine was the distinguished bishop, Northern Africa, fourth century. He was strolling along on the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea. One morning, walking by, he was deep in thought. In that particular time, he was struggling with trying to understand the doctrine for him. At that time, was the doctrine of the Trinity. And he's walking down on the seashore there, and his thoughts were interrupted because he saw this little boy that was running toward the ocean with his bucket. And he watched with some amusement at this little boy filled up his pail with water and he hurried back to the beach because he had dug a little hole in the sand and he poured his bucket of water into that hole. And within seconds, the water was soaked up into that dry, thirsty sand. And so Augustine watched this little boy go down to the ocean again fill up his bucket of water and go back to his hole and pour the water into the hole. But once again, the water went into the hole and the sand swallowed it all up. So Augustine asked him, what are you trying to do? And the little boy replied, I'm trying to put the ocean into this hole. <laughs> I'm trying to put the ocean into this hole, and suddenly Augustine realized that he was thinking just like that little boy. He was trying to cram the ocean of God's truth into this little box of brains that he had, and he was having no more success than the little boy with his bucket. God's eternal plan. Let's just give God praise for his greatness, his grace his greatness, his grace, and his glory. Let's pray together. Father, in your presence today, we just want to give you praise and celebrate your greatness, your grace, your glory. Your thoughts, your ways are beyond us, but you have called us into your kingdom, called us sons and daughters of the living God, called us into your grace, and we have said yes. Anyone listening today that needs to respond to the grace of God, may they do so. May they say their first yes to Jesus. Hear our prayer today as we give you glory and praise. Amen.